Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Barbara Scafidio, preview editor, and I will be your moderator for the next hour. I'm thrilled to welcome our three special guests. Um, one of them is coming to us live from Glasgow, Scotland, um, and you won't be able to see her, but you can hear her. That is Joyce Landry, president and CEO of Landry and Kling Cruise Events. We also have Robert Cow, Global Director of Charter and Incentive Sales for Herdic Rutten, and Josh Adams, Industry Relations Specialist for Streamline Events, and a member of Preview's Editorial Advisory Board. Welcome to you all. Um, these are exciting times, and um, everyone is, is very eager to hear about cruising and get back into the game. So I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves in just a moment, but I wanted to do a tiny bit of housekeeping. While I'm talking, why don't you all in the audience tell me where you're from today? That's always fun. You can use your question box uh, as a chat box and type in where you're calling from. So you know today's session will be recorded. You'll receive a link via email. So don't worry if you have to uh, turn away and you miss something. And as with all of Preview's webinars, you'll receive CEUs for your participation. Please do ask questions throughout. Let's make this really lively. And we will hold a Q&A session at the end. So one more thing, very important. We will be giving away a $100 gift card today. So you do need to stay on until the end. And I will announce the winner then. Enough of me. I'd like to turn the floor over to our guest speakers. So why don't we start with you, Robert? Welcome. If, uh, I think you're on mute. Why don't we move to um, Josh? Can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, hi, Welcome. I'm Josh Adams. Um, yes, I'm with Streamline Events. We are uh, an event management agency based in Emeryville, California. We specialize primarily in the technology market, but my background goes back uh, 30 years uh, with large agencies working a broad spectrum of uh, clients. Um, having done cruises with all three agencies which I have worked with. So very happy to be here and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Can you Thank hear me you. now? We can, so it is your turn. That's what happens when you joke about the mute button before you join the session. <laughs> <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Joyce. And thank you to everyone who's joined today. Uh, we're delighted to be here today. So I'm Robert Kao. Uh, for those of you that have had been on with us before in a webinar or in person. I am the Global Director for Charter and Incentive Sales at Hurtigrun and Expeditions. I've joined the company uh, three years ago and delighted to be here today. A little bit of a veteran in the cruise industry, my head kind of gives it away. Um, I started in 1990 and most of my experience with the exception of about 10 years in between has been always on cruising. So really excited about today's session. Thank you. And Joyce, I know you're there, and uh, we all know who you are, but if you could share a little bit. Oh, thank you, Barbara. I appreciate that. And uh, <laughs> as you said, yeah, I'm live from uh, Glasgow, Scotland, um, and sorry about the technical difficulties. Uh, I think I, I joined the ranks here of the veterans <laughs> that are on the panel. Um, we're celebrating our 40th anniversary next year with Landry and Kling. It's, um, we started, I started in the industry working for cruise lines back in the 1970s and then built the business out of my experience there, heading into an area that no one had even heard of back then, which is meetings and incentives on cruise ships who kind of were at the very, very start, early start then. So we've grown up in the cruise industry. And uh, over time, we've shifted and changed and added a lot of things. And right now, uh, we're doing programs um, that are using ships as floating hotels and uh, and also working more with uh, a lot of the sort of smaller, uh, you know, luxury and expedition lines. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Also involved in sustainability right now. We started a, a website 
last year called sustainableships.com. So it's all part of the same conversation and it's where our industry is heading. Terrific. Just to let you know, um, on the phone we have Miami represented. I see New York City. I see Long Island, uh, Raleigh, Durham. I've got Atlanta. Where are those West Coasters? I'm trying to find up ah, Las Vegas. Can't can't do an event without Las Vegas. <laughs> Milwaukee. Um, sounds like all over the country. So welcome to everyone on the call. Uh, please do send me questions throughout. You do not have to wait until the end and I'll, I'll squeeze them in as we go. So why don't we get right to our conversation? We wanted to start with uh, the topic of why cruise? And uh, we've got, we're gonna kind of move around the panelists. Why don't we start with you, Josh? Uh, when should an event planner consider sourcing um, for a cruise incentive as a viable option to bring in front of your C-level executives. And, and when doing so, let's talk about what how they might respond and, and what um, if they do have objections, what are the typical ones? Okay. Well, in my world, I'd like to start off by saying that I think this should be part of a strategic conversation about your incentive programs or programs overall with a company. Uh, and depending on whether you are doing charter or just putting groups on a ship um, and knowing what your client's uh, sort of progression in the incentive area is, in many cases, um, especially with expedition cruises, we see this as sort of a celebratory or, uh, you know, a pinnacle sort of engagement for our groups. So we like to think about it in a three to five year period mm -hmm. kind of moving in those sorts of blocks so that, that we can sort of build towards that pinnacle in the incentive experience so for example if we might look at a celebratory moment for the company whether they're hitting a 10-year mark a 15-year mark um, or maybe we see sort of a progression that they're going to hit um, a financial goal that they're hoping for and we try to plan it in and around that sort of group um, and we found that cruises have always returned at a very high response rate for experience. So we, again, really trying to build it. Um, the other thing I'd say is we, because, and we'll get to this in terms of length of cruises, knowing that cruises um, need to, knowing when they need to publish their schedules, because cruises tend to be shorter than most cruise lengths, we wanna get ahead of the game so that if a cruise, if we need to shorten it for any reason, the cruise company has enough time to plan for that before they actually publish their schedule. So in that regard, I'd say at least three to five years out for planning. Ah, okay. That's quite long. It's interesting. It's quite long, which is different than just putting somebody on a published cruise. I, I want to make that point, right? right? So if we're really trying to, to make it our own to fit into what we want to do, I'd say three to five years. Otherwise, um, published cruises, if we can fit a group into a published cruise period, then I would say probably two to four years. I do agree what you said about the pinnacle and ha ha that's been my experience as well, but uh, no one knows that better than Joyce. Joyce, do you have anything <laughs> to add? Well, uh, yeah, I, I look at it that way, but also uh, don't not think about a cruise if your mm -hmm. timing is shorter than that, because we been able to slide into um, cancellations or a group that didn't make, meet their numbers or, um, you know, at times even a charter that had um, it decided that they needed to either cancel or change. So, you know, we're always ready. And if someone comes to us and says, I want to do something within six months, I have a, you know, a, a, a last minute promotion that I'm doing. I'm trying to incentivize some people for, you know, my, on my next quarter or something is happening. I mean, we, we like to, you know, think of ourselves as looking for elegant solutions. So, uh, like you know, that. don't not again, not think about it. Cruises can be sometimes um, spontaneous. And it just depends on the uh, the situation, circumstances. Certainly, in the last uh, 18 months during COVID, we found some amazing opportunities at the at the last minute because there were ships available. That's not going to be that way, you know, forever going forward. Yeah. We're really picking back up again, you know. But there could be some unique experiences out there that um, that you could just you know take advantage of. And on that note, I want to say it's great to have a good cruise broker that you trust. <laughs> 
Because right. if you're sitting in my shoes where mostly what we're doing is looking for land packages, having a good broker who's staying on top of um, what might be available, and as Joyce said, in the way of cancellations, um, is crucial. They're the ones who can gather that information very, very quickly for you. Okay. And we on the cruise line side, we always appreciate mm -hmm. having the inputs of, of such experts because as much as all of us in different cruise lines have a lot of experience in the subject matter, um, the reality is that a cruise broker, the likes of Joyce or even Josh, have far more experience working with other um, uh, cruise lines and other events in which they'll be sharing with us an idea of something that's been happening before. Like Joyce just pointed out, an elegant solution, that's something that we would try ourselves. Um, so it's always a way um, to overcome things and to be able to accomplish it. I also like to add, um, and well said both Joyce and Josh, about when to think the celebratory moment is great, but you hit on a really good point, which is the cruise response is so high and you don't have to wait until you actually have to commemorate a specific milestone. Uh, sometimes it's a very valuable thing to reach your audience and get a, a, a pulse read on what is it that they're looking for. And a cruise is high at the top of the list. It still remains one of the things that very, very few people, believe it or not, have done. I don't know what the latest stats are, but the last I checked yeah. was between 70 and 80% of the population has never cruised. When you think of an incentive, what to provide something they've never done, but thinking and want to do it, that would also be a good opportunity. And then last but not least, in terms of when to charter, excellent point, thank you for the heads up uh, provided by Josh. There's always a good amount of time in between before we as a cruise line publish and deploy itineraries, which is when we're able to then customize the length and sometimes even the ports. But not to say that, as Joyce pointed out, once you've actually published and we're selling, there's something else that we look at for a number of reasons. Call it a pandemic, I forbid, or any other circumstances, a cruise could be doing better than the other one and vice versa. So there's something called the load factor. Every cruise line, us included, we have a certain threshold that we work with on when to charter and when to not. And chartering still gives you a lot of flexibility for customization, for privatization, for even just even working within the existing itinerary. So not to ever discount something, always pick up the phone and call and we'll find a way. Thank you, thank you. And we are going to get, dig a lot deeper into charters in just a little bit. Um, why don't we go um, back to you, Josh? What would you say um, is the greatest, well, the one of your biggest considerations when you're looking at cruises, but also one of, what are the, the great advantages? Uh, well, I think Robert pointed it out. I think especially if you can do a charter, um, which is, uh, uh, Joyce, well, you know, there's everything you do, but I, I, I love to charter. So I'm always looking for the size of ship, which will fit my group, because I really want to be able to take over the entire ship. I want to be able to brand it. Um, ships provide incredible branding opportunities which um, I think when your clients come on, different than going to a hotel, when you arrive at a ship and you see that it's branded with a company logo, flying its flag, things are done with the small details during the course of cruising, I think your guests are just overly impressed by you know, what is done. And it doesn't have to be overly expensive. Um, so I think that you, know, you can brand a pool, for example, with a decal, uh, as I said, you can you know, fly the flags. So I think there's some really great opportunities to make a ship your own. Um, and I think when you're, you know, often similar to taking over a hotel, once you've taken over a ship, you know, it really becomes something very, very special, right? That, is, that it is all yours. Um, so those are some of the, the great things about, uh, about taking over a ship and, and doing a charter, in, in my opinion. You, you you referred to pricing. That was actually my next question for everyone. Um, how does pricing and, and the value of a cruise in general compare to a land-based program, say an all-inclusive? Uh, why don't we go to you, Joyce? Well, I think it would all depends on the circumstances, really. But um, we have saved, um, you know, our customers 
so much money over the years and it's not just the basic of the of the cruise price itself but when you're in a hotel you're paying extra for av you're paying extra for a coffee urn you're paying extra for a meeting room um and when you start to add up everything that you don't have to pay for on a cruise ship which is none of that it that is where the value is so on the base itself probably it's it's somewhat comparable but when you know you you constantly are charged all these fees and service fees and taxes and everything that happens in a land base. Um, you know, I just talked to someone last week that they saved over $300,000 on a huge AV load in because they didn't need to bring their AV techs. They didn't need to bring, uh, they didn't need to build up the stage. They didn't need to bring in any of the decor because all of that is already resident on a cruise ship. And for the most part, it's not charged to you. So if you want to have special, parties, private events, and so on, you can do those just within the cost of the cruise itself. That's a very large number. Mm -hmm. uh, does that, do either of you have anything to add, Robert? I'd, I'd, I, I'd echo that. Okay. Yeah. I would as well. I mean, it's pointed out perfectly yeah. said, um, but I would definitely uh, uh, emphasize <laughs> that in the end, 99% of the times an organization from a budget perspective will walk away and look back and say, we definitely saved on actual investments and compare that to return on investment, return on experience. It's a great proposition overall. Yeah. Savings can vary whatever. 15 to 20%, 25, as Joyce pointed out, it depends on the circumstances, but with all those things that are a basic component of any mm -hmm. program, AV, decor, I mean, there's other ancillary charges that we can talk about, which are, you know, transporting your guests from a hotel to a function, to a site where you've got everything all in one space. Um, there's definitely savings. So echoing. Right, Josh. Can I say one more thing too, but it's just a quality, I'm sorry, I didn't miss up here, um, that when you're on a ship, you're dining like a millionaire or a billionaire because right. you're dining in all of these fantastic venues. And for the most part, they're not um, not charged. I'm thinking right. about your ships, Robert. I mean, the food is outstanding. What you'd have to pay in a restaurant in a, in a hotel would be um, almost unaffordable to be able to duplicate that quality of luxury. So when we were talking about charters, it you know it is the epitome of luxury because you're treated mm -hmm. so well. And um, and to duplicate that would be very difficult, if not impossible, in a land base. Good point. And Josh, it is now your turn. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's no, quite all right. Um, I'd add to that uh, one thing we don't often think about in terms of saving cost and depending on how people look at it, but just in terms of planning time. Um, right. The fact that, you know, for example, we put a lot of time into planning the activities if we're on land, working with a DNC, pulling those activities together, which are already organized for you on a cruise. So if you take just the amount of hours put into planning the event and think of that as a cost savings, I think there is a lot to be gained if you are you know, wholeheartedly buying into the package which is offered by your cruise. Okay. So both Josh and Joyce, you work directly with, your, with various clients in various industries. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. It, 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 do you see cruising as um, more popular or a better fit for a certain kind of industry? And also, um, when you're you're going through matching your clients with a specific cruise line and destination, how exactly do you do you fit? Like Josh, you mentioned more of a strategic approach, looking at the objectives of your clients and the qualifiers, wants and likes, and then matching them to a cruise line. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear a little bit about that. You can start, Josh. Um, I think cruising is great for all industries. I think um, we see probably certain industries that buy into cruising a bit more, um, particularly where there's a lot of competition. So I think um, car dealers, for example, uh -huh. where you have automotive manufacturers who are having to one-up one each other to gain you know, the uh, allegiance of a particular dealership. So cruises are a great way to do that. Um, in the case of Robert's company, uh, you know, I think in a, it's a bit of another angle as well, not just salespeople, but I have clients who are trying to woo certain partners or key clients mm -hmm. of theirs. So if you think of key client um, relationships, doing an expedition cruise, for example, is really one way to set yourself apart from your competition. 
here, here you're working with people who have done it all to begin with. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's kind of like blasting off into space, right? What's the next frontier, <laughs> you know, that uh, you can conquer or, or experience? Uh, and there is a mindset out there. Um, so of us wanting to provide that sort of next frontier. So when you say to somebody that you can offer an intimate experience to go to Antarctica or to go to the Galapagos or to cruise um, the Amazon River, that is something typically that most people have not done on their own. And I think it provides a great opportunity for kind of that very high level segment that you're trying to reach. Absolutely. Joyce? Well, I was also gonna bring up, um, we've noticed nonprofits that are doing cruises and charters and trying to woo their more wealthy clientele to bring money their way by offering some very interesting, unusual, exotic types of itineraries like expedition, but they get to go together. You know, so it's come with us, they cost, they, they cost it in so that it's a large donation to the organization. So everybody wins, the nonprofit wins, and then the, um, you know, the people who are going all get a chance to rub elbows with all of the other people who are well known on that same program. So that's become something I, I've seen as a trend. Um, that and, uh, and special interest projects, direct sales, um, that's, that's, a, that's a big one. Anyone yeah. that has large field sales teams, um, that's a, something to look at. But it's just interesting, you know, where the, where the business comes from these days and, and you just never know. So we've, we've found some very, um, you know, interesting um, sources out there of, of business. And I think that uh, with all the different uh, types of cruises that are out there, there's something for everyone. I want to go back to what something Joyce said. I, I think direct sell marketing is also one of those uh, areas which is very popular for cruises. Um, and especially because those companies tend to like to make their events more family focused as well. Um, and I think cruises are a great option in that regard because there, there really is something for everybody. If there's enough space uh, on the ship, um, and we've sold this multiple times, um, it's just a great option for that particular segment. Works, works even better than land, in my opinion. I think particularly one of the things that works the best with direct selling companies is, um, and I've worked with a couple myself, the company themselves get to see a huge increase in overall engagement when the qualifiers see their cruise as being dangled in front of them just because mm -hmm. they want to do a cruise. Um, whether whatever the kind of cruise that would be, whatever category or sector of the industry that would be. And of course, I have to speak about expedition cruises, which kind of, you know, summing everything up that you said before, it is really truly the perfect setting for anyone to come on a ship, but really not a cruise per se, because it's really all about the destination. We'll cover a little bit more of that later yeah. on, but well said. I do think when my, actually my next question was just, we've been talking, about expedition cruises, but we really haven't defined them for people on the audience who might not know a whole lot about them. There's certainly an educational aspect. I mean, how does it how does it differ from traditional cruising? And I know you're going to be uh, doing a presentation at the end about um, Hurtigruten, but I'd love to just get a little deeper into what the differences are and perhaps the pros and cons of that versus a traditional cruise. Robert, yeah, why don't you, could you tell Okay, that? and I, I was going to yeah, say, I want to hear your thoughts. <laughs> okay, well, and, and it really varies in a number of things, but an expedition is that you're exploring an area of the world, a place that either you've never been to or people are not commonly going to for a number of reasons. Hard to get there, difficult to go, difficult to travel, wouldn't do it on your own. Um, expedition for us means doing just that, going to regions and parts of the world that are high on people's bucket list because they want to get to it, um, but they just don't want to go there. They want to go there in the comfort of a certain style. They want to go there and learn and be told and be guided. And I'm giving us a, a super um, holistic uh, view, uh, overview of what an expedition mm -hmm. cruising is. And of course, that brings us to the ship size. That brings us to the ship standards. You're on a smaller ship. You, you got to find ships that for a number of reasons are able to navigate and to, to, to transit to these places to provide that experience. It's all about the actual 
onboard experience, not as it relates to a cruise, um, stepping ahead of my presentation here, we're not gonna see casinos, we're not gonna see nightly entertainment. It's all about the educational aspect and how immersive that experience is going to be that at the end of your journey, when you walk home and you wanted to go to Iceland, you really come back with, I had no idea. I, I thought I had an idea of what I wanted to see and what I could expect, but walking away from having been there, but really walking alongside with true experts in various different subject matters and fields, whether it be marine biology, culture, history, sustainability, you name it, um, it's what it's about. All while in the setting of, we like to call it a base camp at sea at a very high standard. That's the overall holistic uh, exp uh, explanation. Robert, I think that's a great yeah. way to put it. And that's one thing that I really appreciate about expedition cruises is that you're really, it's almost like, for lack of a better term, it's almost like going to university for two weeks, right? The people you come Not across, university. the subject matter, exactly, uh, university at sea, uh, the subject matter experts um, that you come across who are talking about what you're seeing, the fact that you're going into places that you wouldn't feel comfortable going to on your own, there's that sense of security that if you know with, for example, Hurta Gruten, that you're you're that they've already scoped this out, that there's a sort of safety element to be able to go. I wouldn't go sail around the Arctic on my own. I wouldn't, you know, even pretend to be, you know, I want to know that where I'm going, while and I appreciate that things are not as developed, right, in these locations where I'm going. So that's one thing about expedition, which is a little bit different than cruising. Not everything is built out. It's not like somebody's bought an island and they've built a big beach club for you to go and have pina coladas. That's not the point of an expedition cruise. Um, but whatever you're doing is well planned out, very secure, and provides you that sort of that safety net to do something that you probably wouldn't do on your own. Sounds wonderful. <laughs> I it's have to their say. Knowledge. I mean, you think about an incentive, you know, why right. would an organization want to reward or why do they need to reward someone? Because they want to enrich their lives. And what a, be what a better way to enrich someone's life that with knowledge and information that turns into power. Who doesn't want that? Yeah. Right. Could I add something, Joyce? Barbara? Absolutely, Joyce. We, we yeah. haven't forgotten about you there. No, no, no. <laughs> I can't see you, so I just don't know when to jump in. Anyway, I mean, I, I had a, um, a a charter to um, to the Galapagos, and it was with Type A personalities, and I was wondering how they were all going to, you know, deal with it. They loved it, and you know, they put their phones away on the first day. They were in zodiacs with a t-shirt, you no know, shorts on, with a big smile on their face, and they were they. It was like adult camp, is what one of them described, mm -hmm. because I got a chance to play. It's like who of us as children did not want to be an explorer, and so all of a sudden you put this, this kid face on and you go out there, but in a you know, obviously very nice quality. So you get a chance to have your 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 nice quality, but at the same time you can play and there's lecture programs and you learn and you can and uh, I just what I love about uh, about your ships, Robert, is they have that the area and I, I can't remember the name of it right now where they have all of the uh, uh, the microscopes and you can you can look at the um, you can experiment and you can bring things from the shore onto the ship and they have people that are teaching you all these different things about where you where you're going to and I just it's it's like play it's great it's the science center and what you just described is what happens on our expeditions and we like to call it we're helping you connect with the inner explorer we all have one whether it's driving to the supermarket every day and wanting to learn a different route or who lives next door or literally just learning more about the place and the planet that we live in so the science well, center I, my favorite i like that so let's dig a little <laughs> deeper into charters because um you know we're getting a couple of questions about them and we started speaking about them before Great um, questions, by the way. Thank, thank the audience. <laughs> we love it. So, at what point does a program qualify to to become a charter? You know, when do you when do you make that decision, and when can you move forward with a charter? I'll, I'll leave that for Robert. Well, I'm going to defer that for the end. I'm going to ask Joyce to maybe give her own input um, based on the number okay. of charters, and then Josh, and then I'll give my overall as well, if you don't mind. Okay, sure. Thank Do you. I... 
if, I hate to call it, say it depends again, but it whenever someone approaches us for a charter, we ask a lot of questions. And mm -hmm. typically by the end of our questions, we'll know whether someone is truly ready for it or not. And a lot of it has to do with, are, are you ready to take the leap? Because uh, it is a leap. You are buying a ship. It is yours. Can't give it back. Can't cancel it. <laughs> you have to really know. You have to know your numbers. You have to feel really comfortable about, you know, what you're what you're buying. You have to feel very good about, um, you know, where you're going, what you're doing. So when someone's really confident about an experience that they want to provide and they're ready to take the leap, then uh, we go out and seriously look for a charter for them and and make sure that it fits. I mean, it has to fit the size. You don't want to ship this too big. It would be too expensive. You'd be giving. You'd have too many rooms that are empty it can't be too small because then if your qualifiers qualify over so it's just a matter of speaking to um you know to someone this is like i guess going back again to you know finding your experts that can guide you to find out when it's really the right thing but when it's the right thing it just happens and i'll, I'll give you an example it's just where where i am right now um it was only this is unusual i will say it was about a week and a half ago that I was asked to put this charter here and um, and we signed it, sealed it, got the ship here and now I'm here and people are arriving tomorrow. We're boarding tomorrow. This is a very unusual situation and it was for um, an urgent need for rooms uh, for a conference that is um, uh, needed, de needed additional rooms. It's a climate conference. So sometimes that happens and when it's the right need and the right fit, you just run with it and you just have to, um, you know, figure out exactly well we can help you figure out when that's the right moment i'm glad to hear they needed more rooms for a climate conference by the way <laughs> that's that's true do you have anything to add either of you or i've got plenty more questions here about joyce yeah, no, i think joyce hit it uh, squarely on the head one you really need to know um two things you need to be ready to take that leap of faith and realize that there's no cancel that you're you're in it if you're committing to it uh, which means that you really have to good, have a good sense about your numbers as well, right? You also have to be ready to make that financial commitment so because it is different than buying a land package. Um, you need to be ready to address a letter of credit, for example, uh, for most cruise lines. Um, there are some that have now gone to uh, tiered payment schedules, um, but as a rule, that's not the case I have found. It may change. So yeah, I think you just need to take all of those things into account. For sure, and and there's there's a couple more things in the list. Like Joyce says, it could be a bunch of questions that get qualified. Um, but more and more, um, you find organizations that are wanting to do an incentive, and maybe more so on the top tier incentive, that for a number of reasons they want exclusivity. They will not want to have anyone else around them for a number of reasons. Right. We're, we're not going to discuss the whys. Um, sometimes it could be a lifestyle. Sometimes it could just be a corporate compliance. Sometimes it just wants to be that sort of level of exclusivity and really going above and beyond to reward your performance that calls for a charter, um, that makes it um, uh, that be in a charter. Um, maybe it's some of the programming on board that they're going to be requiring it doesn't allow the cruise line to be able to sort of commingle the different uh, livelihoods on board, but it's that. And, and, and it is something that is to be considered because it is a financial risk. Uh, I'm glad to say that uh, we're one of those cruise lines that for a number of reasons, mainly because of my experience and the size of our fleet and also our eagerness to introduce our products and our concepts, um, if for whatever reason, understanding what it requires for an organization to acquire a letter of credit, we will always work with even a first time charter on a charter possibility uh, with an accelerated payment schedule, as a tier payment schedule, as Josh pointed out. And we really work in ways that really make this um, both easy and feasible for them to be able to operate. So I wanna just kind of throw that out there for the future on any of and our uh, expeditions. Robert, I just want to point out how important that is. I, I appreciate that you said that because in this era that we're in right now where people are so uncertain about making a commitment to a program, whether it's land-based or cruise, uh, when you're working with procurement departments and CFOs who have taken a bigger right. part in the decision-making process, one of the big topics of conversation is financial commitment. So the fact that you're willing to do that, I think really helps those of us who are in our position to make a stronger argument 
to choose a charter or to choose a cruise. A hundred percent. That's perfect. Yeah. I was going to add on to that too, because Robert, in, in that flexibility, there are times people come to us and they don't ask for a charter, but knowing that we can recommend a charter will put us in the realm of being yeah. able to make it a possibility because they, they may not even know that a charter exists or that they could charter a ship. But if we can recommend it in the process, then uh, that's we're halfway there. Terrific. Yeah. This is probably a great time to move into a presentation um, that Robert's going to share a little bit more about her to Gruten and has a great video following that. So we will move it over to you, Robert. Thank you so much. You are welcome. We should be ready. Can everyone see the screen? We can. All right, well, thank you again. And we would like to end this great panel discussion today with sharing some information about recent news pertaining to our global expansion of expedition voyages. So Herdy Gruden Expeditions recently announced the offering of expedition voyages to one of the most iconic destinations on the planet. You just heard Joyce making a little commercial she didn't know, the Galapagos <laughs> Island. And I am going to take you through this fascinating destination and really what to expect when exploring with us. So let's dive right in. First, for anyone that might be new to our webinars or perhaps unfamiliar with our brand, here's a bit of who we are. We are an exploration company in the truest sense. And this goes all the way back to our very first exploration to Svalbard, which is an archipelago in Norway, in 1896. We have since continued to pioneer and lead in this space and have become the world leader in sustainable exploration travel. We offer unique, immersive, authentic, and up-close experiences with nature on small and intimate ships which have been purposely built for expeditions. And I'm talking about both the inside and the outside. We are for explorers and by explorers. Our operational expertise extend beyond more than 128 years. And today we operate expeditions in a number of both polar and other warmer water destinations. We are extremely proud to say that we have the most sustainable and greenest expedition fleet in operation. How so, you might be wondering? Let's just say that sustainability for us is more than an afterthought. It is literally the core of everything that we do. And with over a century of experience, our captains, expedition teams, and really returning guests have truly witnessed the impact of climate change on the vulnerable areas we explore with their own eyes. Hence why we've committed to the UN's sustainable development goals, putting them at the heart of who we are and what we do. These are our guiding principles, and it is taking us steps ahead of current regulations to offer you, to offer your clients, but really your attendees as well. Truer and greener, more sustainable expedition voyages on the planet, but also for the planet. Yes, let me say it again. We're super proud of the progress we've made in a range of areas, but we're not stopping there. This is just a start, and there are many, many more meaningful and exciting initiatives to come. We were first to institute a fleet-wide ban on non-essential single-use plastic. We invest heavily in green technology like hybrid power ships and biofuels from food waste. We launched the world's first hybrid-powered expedition ships in 2019 and in 2020, and we're so proud and delighted. I'm talking about the MS Roald Amundsen and Fritz of Nansen, and we're definitely planning to have more in the very near future. We have stopped using heavy fuel oil decades ago, and we are still campaigning for a worldwide ban. We are all for stricter visitor reg regulations and the delicate destinations that we explore. We inspire guests on every one of our expedition cruises to be environmental ambassadors. We collaborate with international scientific institutes, and we share vital research data. We support local communities by making a point to trade with small-scale suppliers. We engage in voluntary beach cleanups in many of the areas we go ashore. And finally, we have established the Hurtigruden Foundation, which funds a variety of different worldwide eco-projects. So that's a bit of who we are and what we do. So 
let's jump right into our newest destination, drum roll. Galapagos. Starting this coming January of 2022, Hurdy Gruden Expeditions will be expanding the destination roster to include the Galapagos Islands, offering modern day explorers an in depth adventure better described, as you see on the screen, as beyond imagination. We are extremely I want to make sure that you're not seeing this on my screen. Okay. We are extremely excited to explore one of the most spectacular destinations on the planet. And we've seen a clear trend of travelers and organizations seeking out truly new, unique, and meaningful travel experiences to reward top performance and create memories that will last a lifetime. Combined with a sharp increase in demand for small ships, I must also say. Quite famous for its unique nature and wildlife, this isolated volcanic archipelago known as the Galapagos Islands sits a thousand kilometers off the coast of Ecuador, and it has mesmerized travelers and scientists for centuries. Truly overflowing with a diverse range of unique plant and animal species, this is where Charles Darwin's discoveries and observations led to his renowned theory of evolution. The Galapagos is also one of the world's foremost destinations for wildlife viewing for those that enjoy, me included. And it is hidden away in the vastness of the ocean of the Pacific Ocean. This archipelago was formed millions of years ago when subsea eruptions pushed up a group of volcanic islands. You could see it there on the photo. They were at first arid and barren due to how remote they are but were soon colonized by rainforest animals from Central and South America. They came floating across on rafts of vegetation. Clearly only birds and reptiles could survive such a long voyage, right? And so the Galapagos became seeded by new arrivals. Each of these species was compelled to adapt to the very different island environments, making natural selection apparent to the naturalist Charles Darwin, Charles Darwin when he arrived. Filled with wild beauty, unique ecology, and rugged volcanic scenery, little has changed since Darwin set foot here in 1835. It is sometimes called a living laboratory, as these remote islands are a unique example of pristine nature, giving us an insight into the very process of life on Earth. Again, it was here that Darwin's experiences led him to write his groundbreaking book about evolution titled On the Origin of Species. Our expedition journey to these beyond belief islands is what I like to call them, truly follow in Darwin's footsteps and bringing all of your program attendees closer to the animals and sites that inspire him in ways they would have never imagined. Really a true incentive experience if you ask me. The Galapagos Islands Archipelago and National Park you'll be surprised to know or pleased to know that are also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The islands are formed of lava piles and dotted with shield volcanoes, many of which are actually periodically active, consisting of 13 major islands, six smaller islands, and scores of inlets and rocks lying near the equator. The biggest islands being Isabela, Fernandina, Santiago, Santa Cruz, Española, San Cristóbal, and Floriana. We're actually calling the Galapagos the Antarctica of warm waters due to the extensive range of unique wildlife. From famous giant turtles which lumber around the greener parts of the islands, and Joyce can tell us more at the end, to the scaly marine iguanas that have evolved to graze on underwater vegetation. The Galapagos is such a special destination for nature lovers due to the uniqueness of each island, a huge range of terrain terrestrial and aquatic wildlife flourishes in this heaven of biodiversity. What's more, having evolved with no major predators, much of the wildlife is impervious to the presence of people and remains remarkably tame. Of course, we'll maintain a respectable distance, but you'll definitely be able to get close to the animals of which there are the big 15. So keep an eye out for them. Here's a picture of them. I won't go through in great detail, but it's 15 beautiful, impressive um, animals. Truly spectacular. As for the climate, let's talk a little bit about that. So the weather seasons in the Galapagos Islands, you'll be pleased to know that is set and defined entirely by the arrival and or the departure of the currents that surround them. 
due to the hot conditions, our plan activities are scheduled and arranged in such a way as to avoid walking during the hottest hours of the day when the wildlife is not so active. But one thing is for sure, there is no bad weather in the Galapagos ever. Our Galapagos Island adventure itinerary called in Darwin's footsteps starts with two nights in Quito, which are optional, whether a program as a group or a charter, which is one of South America's most charming capitals. This world heritage city of graceful Spanish era architecture is packed with cozy restaurants and small artisanal shops. From here, we'll pay a visit to an active volcano and we will go on a nature walk in the stunning surroundings of Cotopaxi National Park and experience also a vibrant open air market. On day three, we fly your guests to the Galapagos for the six night cruise, stepping aboard our ship, which I'll mention more and show you pictures in a minute, setting sail for the most unforgettable expedition cruise. Here we will experience the very very best of UNESCO protected Galapagos. Of course, this being a Hurtigruden expedition, as Joyce pointed out, it is a science-oriented expedition. Your guests will learn about Darwin's discoveries, as guess what? They will be making a few of their own discoveries, so that's actually very good. Talk about a lifetime experience. Safety and sustainability are always at the core of our operations, and our aim is to leave the smallest footprint behind wherever we go. Please remember that the exact route and program may vary according to weather conditions and wildlife encounter. So this is the newest baby in our family, the MS Santa Cruz, which will offer guests, again, a year-round, one-of-a-kind experience. Hurtigruden Expeditions entered into a long-term strategic partnership with Ecuador-based Metropolitan Touring, some of most of you might be very familiar with that name. They are the most experienced and renowned travel company in the Galapagos. Metropolitan Touring has offered in intimate and unique encounters with the island's wildlife since they pioneer expedition cruises in the Galapagos almost 70 years ago. Your program attendees will explore the Galapagos in style and comfort on board this beautiful and fully upgraded ship, which we're adding now to our growing fleet of small purpose-built expedition ships exciting. As you can see, she is a sleek, super comfortable, and very spaciously stylish expedition ship. She's ideally suited to remote adventures. It encompasses a relaxed atmosphere and high-quality surroundings. The small size with a guest capacity of only 90 guests allows for a very cozy yet classy environment. The onboard facilities are excellent, and you can look forward to mouth-watering dishes prepared by our chefs as well as comfortable cabins to relax in after each exciting day of discovery. The ship has been completely refurbished, as I pointed out, in true modern hurdy Scandinavian style inside, plus our signature black, red, and white paint on the outside and on the ship hull. She features excellent onboard facilities, which include our unique onboard science center. The small size also allows us to easily venture off the beaten track locations. The MS Santa Cruz, too, is environmentally sustainable and socially conscious with the local community, with the operation being carbon neutral. That's very important. There you have a picture, a few pictures of all cabins, um, private bathrooms, all refurbished with new carpet, new wall covering, new furniture, paint shades, there's artwork and other touches. We have four different categories that we offer, um, whether for a full ship charter or for an individual program. And they could be either the Explorer Family category, the Voyager Cabin category, or the Explorer Cabin, all the way to the Darwin Suite. All of them feature and offer a large picture window and beds that can either convert from a twin to a double. Very beautiful. Um, some of the ship common areas, we have the Beagle Restaurant and the Explorer Lounge and Bar. One of the two outdoor observation decks you can see there on the bottom left. Um, and of course, our science center in a smaller scale than what is found on our larger expedition ships. However, still features a microscope, interactive screens, uh, exhibit of different clone bones that we have, books. And this is also where some of the lectures will take place. Again, everything is included in your expedition. Um, these are some of the things that we include. Um, all the way from a reusable aluminum water bottle that can be refilled at water stations located throughout the ship. Um, the loaning of boots and trekking poles, uh, the Wi-Fi does have a nominal fee, obviously all of your meals uh, is included, expedition team, lectures and such are included as well as activities. 
which speaking of activities, there's a list of some of the things that we do in all getting closer to the national wonders, uh, the natural wonders, I'm sorry. There's a wide range of activities that they can choose from and the expedition team will always guide you on shore on each and every visit. Speaking of them, sailing with us on the Santa Cruz is our team and these are hand-picked experts with many years of experience in ecology and wildlife of Galapagos itself. We have a one to 11 ratio of guests per expedition guide. So one guide for every 11 guests. This is to enjoy a very tailored cruise experience. Some are nature guides, others have worked on remote research and conservation projects, but each team member is deeply committed to sustainability and trained to safeguard you the wildlife and the fragile habitats that we explore. They'll also prove to be specialists in a variety of fields, delivering engaging lectures and talks, and you can join them in the Ship's Science Center for Hands-On Learning and Citizen Science Projects. They'll also accompany you, as I just mentioned, off the ship on landings, scouting out to the areas, answering questions, pointing out interesting sites, and really just taking the lead on thrilling hikes. Um, last but not least, um, safety is our highest priority. And like most of our cruise line partners, we have implemented uh, strict measures on all of our expedition cruises and our coastal product as well that is really reduced, it's designed to reduce the risk of COVID-19 and other infectious diseases. These are constantly being monitored and they evolve, but they start but not limited to a very comprehensive embarkation screening process, um, obviously a respect of social distance and comfort being in mind and uh, number one all the time, continuous monitoring to identify all the risk and of course take quick and necessary action, uh, an onboard medical center with high quality, um, experienced partners in this field, both of health and safety. And of course, all of these protocols continue to evolve um, based on the condition and the overall location of your sailing. We also have a medical officer on board. So in summary, why I heard you get an expedition? An expedition cruise for an incentive or any other corporate uh, program for that matter, ventures to places many have only ever dreamed about and our small ship expeditions will take you beyond the usual highlights going further, sorry, my screen, going further to remote communities and hidden vistas few get to see. Rather than entertainment, the focus is on active exploration, bringing you off the ship to really discover each destination. But we will always be doing so with sustainability at the core. Again, supporting local businesses, respecting traditions, and protecting habitats. A hand-picked expedition team of experts will be with you every step of the way on all of our expeditions, complementing the Ship Science Center that covers a wide range of topics related to the destination. All ships on our fleet are small and agile to medium-sized hybrid-powered vessels, all modern combining advanced technology with efficient engines and light fuels. While on board, your guests, your program, your incentive qualifiers will experience a very informal, welcoming atmosphere, comfortable staterooms, luxurious suites, stylish interiors, all made from natural materials. And lastly, it's the culmination of more than 128 years of our exploration history, harnessed into incredible expeditions and momentous experiences that stay with you forever. With that being said, I cannot wait to explore again soon. So let's go. Hope you enjoy that. Terrific.
go again. <laughs> Makes you want to go, Robert. <laughs> In fact, I would like to read a, um, a note from one of our attendees, Eileen. She's thanking us all for everything we're sharing. She says, I wish I was on a cruise right now. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to go over just a little bit because we did start a couple of minutes late and then I will be announcing um, the winner of our uh, $100 gift card. Please do send questions. We've got a couple minutes left and we'd love to hear from you. Um, Michelle, Mix, uh, who is attending, has some very specific questions for you about size, Robert. So. I will put you both together afterwards. Um, I'll start with one about the length of expedition cruising, um, that they can be longer than a regular cruise. Uh, is that always the case? And are there shorter um, than normal cruises that can work for the incentive category? Uh, either Robert or um, Joyce maybe could speak to that. I'll start. So obviously we have a, a, a very large selection of different itineraries and voyages that we offer for the true explorer connoisseur to the one that is just starting. Um, and it is true that traditionally these are long by nature because people want to travel to more places and really the world is it's almost limitless when it comes to that. But the reality is that we have over 35, 45 different departures that range in size and in duration, all expedition um, type that start sometimes three nights, four nights to the maximum of an eight nights. An eight night is very common for say our Iceland circumnavigations, uh, our Svalbard circumnavigations, which is the, again, as I mentioned earlier, the Northern archipelago of Norway, uh, Spitsbergen, which is the realm of the polar bear. So the reality is that you've got a lot of different um, options to choose from. And again, that's speaking about our published itineraries. If and when you have the time and the, con the conditions sort of align themselves for a full ship charter, we can customize. We can do three, four, five, six nights in Iceland, in Svalbard, in South America as well. Um, I think by far the longest expedition that we are seeing today is creating a lot of more demand is our Antarctica 10-night cruises. Um, and I'm sure that most of you would relate to this with the pandemic. The time away from home has changed so much right now where nowadays we can work remote, we could do things, you know, out and about. So taking somebody on a 10-night expedition um, for an incentive, it's not as horrific as it would have been five years ago where I can be away from it because the reality is you're going to overlap on two weekends. So it all works out in the end. So I hope that adds a little bit of color in terms of the overall. But it's a very valid question that traditionally, and they're known for, for being long. I don't want that to be the case when it comes to us because that is not necessarily always true. And even when there are some that are long, we can customize shorter. Perfect. Let's squeeze in one more question. We um, we have a question from Pat about um, how relevant is expedition cruising in today's environment in terms of safety and hygiene? Um, are more companies looking in this direction for their events to be um, safe with just their group chartering? Uh, who would like to take that one? I, I could jump into Joyce? that. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, because we start when we when COVID first happened, we sat down with everybody in our office and said, okay, well, what are we going to do? How what are we going to focus on? And expedition was one of the areas that we decided would be our future, because it's outdoors. Everyone is in fresh air. Generally speaking, the, the it's an environment that has more space. It's just you, there's fewer number of people on each ship, so they don't people will not feel like they're in crowds, you're, it's less crowded. And um, and just the, the feeling that you're working, you're in an environment that has sustainability attached to it, that uh, you're doing something for the planet. And I think that during COVID, what people realize is that they didn't just want to throw away their time that they had to ex go out into the world. They really wanted to start making a difference. So I think exploration fits very nicely with sort of our new COVID mentality of let's try to preserve our, our earth a little bit more and let's do something that is more than just taking a vacation, but it's actually giving back. Well said. We are, um, we're coming up on a full hour, so we are going to have to close here. I'd like to congratulate Cindy Kramer, who will be receiving the $100 gift card. And I truly enjoyed this hour. So thank you to Joyce, 
Robert and Josh, and I uh, hope we can do it again. Uh, it sounds like a very exciting product, and um, I wish you all the best. Everyone in the audience, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Great day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.